Welcome to our webinar featuring the future of long-term care and benefits. What counties and employers need to know. I'm Mark Levine and I am the Deputy Director of your New York State Association of Counties. Our topic today discusses trends in long-term care and how long-term care is a growing and critical part of the healthcare system here in New York State and across the nation. This is one of our webinars that's a little bit ahead of, a, ahead of the curve. We know that there are things coming down in long-term care and we wanted to be out there providing some education and training about what those are for our county employers across the state. This webinar will provide you with an overview of the latest trends and developments in long-term care, including the following, the impending long-term care crisis, potential legislation to address this challenge, and a hybrid life with long-term care insurance solution. Before we begin the presentation, we have a few brief housekeeping announcements. <clears throat> I'd like it to introduce Jeanette Stanziano at this time. Jeanette is NYSAC's Director of Training and Education, and she is running today's webinar. Jeanette. Thanks, Mark. Just a couple of quick uh, housekeeping measures before we begin. We want to let you know that as we do with all NYSAC webinars, we will be recording this program. So if you have any colleagues that you'd like to share this uh, webinar with today, you can find a recording of this program as well as a PDF of the slide deck in two places. One, you can find it at the NYSAC website at www.nysac.org under archived webinars. You can find that under the events and training tab. You can also go to NYSAC's channel on YouTube NYSAC TV online on YouTube. We want to encourage you to feel that you can um, submit questions at any time throughout today's webinar. We ask that the way you handle your questions is to type them in through your dashboard under the questions tab. Type them in at any time and when we get to Q&A at the end of the program, we will address all questions that we can get to. Thanks Mark, back to you. All right, and just to reiterate, this is we have two experts on our panel today, and if you have any questions about providing long-term care in your or county, or just general questions about long-term care, we really encourage you to ask the uh, questions of our panelists as we have them here today. Our speakers today are from Assured Partners, which is a NYSAC Excelsior partner, and we appreciate what they do for counties and municipalities across the state. And they really help us to deliver solutions, training and education for our members, so we thank them. The first speaker is Anthony Brothers. He's the Senior Vice President of Sales at Assured Partner, and he is responsible with, for assisting in driving growth and is one of their lead consultants in their Western New York offices. Anthony has 13 years experience specializing in self-funding with a focus on municipalities, counties, and school districts across New York State. Our second speaker is Mick Gibo. As the sales executive and practice leader with Assured Partners, Mick oversees voluntary benefits vertical in the Northeast. He has over 18 years of experience helping employers evaluate, install, and administer voluntary employee benefit programs for their employees and members. Thank you, Anthony and Mick, for joining us today and lending your experience and expertise for our members. Uh, at this time, I would it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Anthony Brothers. Thank you, Mark. Um, <clears throat> First, I just want to say I appreciate everybody jumping on the uh, the webinar this morning. We appreciate your time, um, and we feel that this is a very important topic to try to get out in front of because a lot of employers in the market are kind of in wait and see mode with the legislation um, that's going through the the state legislature right now. 
Um, just to give a brief introduction about Assured Partners real quick before we dive in. Um, we were founded in 2011. Since then, we've grown into one of the largest independent consulting agencies and brokerages in the United States. We have 250 plus offices around the country, 9,000 employees. Um, we have the 11th largest overall consulting agency in the United States and the fifth largest in property and casualty with about 900,000 happy employer customers. Um, currently, we work with uh, five counties across the state, um, our office. We work with Genesee County, Broome County, Cortland County, Niagara County, and Cattaraugus County, in addition to City of Buffalo, City of Niagara Falls, um, North Tonawanda in Western New York, the City of Tonawanda, and Town of Vestal out in Eastern New York, and the City of Jamestown. So we are uniquely qualified, we feel, to um, you know, give our presentation here today to our the, this audience. and um, you know, we, we just really appreciate the opportunity. Um, with that being said, I'm going to turn it over to our expert, um, Mick, to start the presentation. Mick? Thank you, Anthony. Uh, good morning. I appreciate everybody's time this, today um, and joining us to learn a little bit more about the current landscape of long-term care. As Anthony and Mark mentioned, I'm the Voluntary Benefits Practice Leader for Assured Partners here in the Northeast. In that role, I work closely with our regional sales and service teams to help employers determine whether or not they have a high performing voluntary employee benefits program. In that process, many different insurance product types are typically evaluated. However, none are currently getting more attention or consideration than long-term care. So we understand our time is valuable. So our goal today is to keep our presentation brief and informative and to leave plenty of time at the end for questions and answers. We're going to cover the following topics. Start with an overview of long-term care. This is really the basics. What it is, what it costs, how it's accessed, and how it's currently being paid for. We also want to spend some time talking about the growing need and contributing factors that may be leading us to what many consider to be an impending long-term care crisis. We also want to discuss state legislation, both here and in other states, that's really designed to address these concerns. Toward the end, we're going to explore some private insurance options, uh, including what's available now and how you can access these programs. And then lastly, we want to discuss what might be coming down the road and share some pro proactive strategies on, that you can consider in an attempt to stay out ahead of potential future legislations. Uh, Anthony, next slide. Oh, back one. Back, I think we're going in the wrong direction. One more, there we go, <laughs> thanks. So, yep, that's it. So long-term care, you know, at the simplest form, it's a type of care that's provided to people who need assistance with acti activities of daily living, right? So ADLs are bathing, dressing, eating, toileting, transferring, et cetera. Um, for reasons that I'm about to explain, demand for flexible long-term care solutions is increasing and is crucial provide viable solutions to employees and their family members. So what's it mean to you? Long-term care, it's an important topic here in New York for, for multiple reasons, right? There's a growing population of older adults and people with disabilities who need long-term care services. The number of people age 65 and older in New York State is projected to increase by 30% by the year 2040. Additionally, the number of people with disabilities is projected to increase by 15% by the year 2040. Um, as a result, many states, including New York, are considering legislation to help address this issue. In addition, many employers are also looking to offer long-term care insurance benefits to provide ad additional financial protection for their employees and or members. The cost of care is, is, is something we're gonna spend some time on today. Rising costs and limited access to care, especially in rural areas, have resulted in family members serving as primary caregivers, many of which are also employed individuals, right? So it has an effect on the workforce, not just on the individual. Uh, next slide. So what does long-term care cost? So I think this slide illustrates uh, very clearly some national averages are from October, 2022, there's no confusion. That's a, this type of comprehensive medical care is expensive. I mean, the annual cost 
for a home health aid is over $50,000, and a room in a nursing facility averages over 100,000. Next slide. Uh, next slide. Having a little bit of trouble, Mick. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, we got it. Thank you. So how's this coverage paid for up until this point? Okay, it's, it's a common misconception that Medicare or Medicaid will cover all expenses. The truth is you will need to be able to cover much of the costs yourself in the form of either cash or private insurance. So the way Medicare works is day one through 20, it pays in full if you're hospitalized for at least three consecutive days before entering a Medicare approved skilled nursing facility. Days 21 through 100, it pays the difference between the total daily cost and a significant copay if you continue to need skilled nursing care. After day 100, it does not pay the additional benefits. Okay, so that moves us to Medicaid which will pay for nursing home care. However, most individuals will not qualify unless he or she has less than $2,000 in countable assets. So this is the spend down process that many of you may have heard of or be aware of from personal experience in which the individual is in a self-pay environment until their assets are reduced enough where they can apply for Medicaid, okay? And the last uh, bucket here on the screen is personal insurance. We're gonna talk about this toward the end of our presentation. And there's different types of insurance coverage, um, but the, the main takeaway here is less than 10% of Americans currently have private long-term care coverage. A century ago, there were more than 100 companies, insurance companies, selling long-term care policies, and today there are less than a dozen. Most of the remaining options are individual. They're not group-sponsored plans. They're rather expensive, and they have significant underwriting requirements to secure coverage. Next slide. So long-term care, it, it, it's truly a multi-generational problem. You know, our national demographics are changing. By 2030, there'll be more people over the age 65 than there are under 18. It's estimated that 70% of those over 65 will need long-term care. When you factor this in along with the cost of care and the lack of private insurance options that we just covered, you can see why many people people feel that we may be facing an impending crisis. Uh, next slide. So let's talk a little bit about what the states are doing to get out ahead of it and, and, and address this, okay? So many states do believe this is true. They, Washington was the first state to implement a tax for long-term care to help protect the solvency of the state Medicaid program. Since then, 15 additional states are looking at similar measures in it, in it, anticipation of the expected surge in long-term care needs due to the retirement of baby boomers. California has created a task force to form and evaluate plan recommendations. Uh, current recommendations that they're looking at include multiple plan designs uh, and contribution rates, a payroll tax up to 2%, uh, no income gap, possibilities of both employer and employee contributions, and a 12 month look back for private coverage to apply for an exemption. So let's discuss the law in Washington state because that's something that was enacted already and it's in force and that happened on January 1st of 2022. So real quickly, the basics of the Washington Carers Fund, it is a 0.58% of payroll tax. It's uncapped and it's for all employees that live and work in the state of Washington. The resulting state benefit that the fund provides is a $36,500 long-term care lifetime benefit, okay? So for those of you that are familiar with, for example, New York State statutory disability, that is a, a, a true benefit that's available, right? It's um, for any entity that needs to offer it to their, to their employees by law. No one, I think, is gonna believe that $170 a week is enough for anybody if they're sick or injured and unable to work. The same goes for um, the legislation we're seeing in Washington and other states as being considered. It's a, it's a limited long-term care benefit. It's better than not having anything at all. With the cap in Washington, the way the law is written, it's $36,500. Okay. So that's the, the tax that's taken. That is the benefit that would be payable if it's utilized. 
the benefits are not portable in Washington. So if a resident moved to another state, they would they retire, for example. They would not qualify for the benefit any longer despite paying the tax during their working years in Washington, okay? Another very important factor that we'll talk about a little bit over the remaining time today is Washington State provided a one-time, limited time offer to allow employees who are enrolled in their own comparable private long-term care insurance to opt out of the tax. Okay. The result was during this opt-out window, over half a million employees went out and secured private coverage and were exempted from paying into the tax. Okay. Uh, next slide. Next slide. So let's talk about New York. Okay, so uh, let's go to the next slide. Thank you. So just, just to go over the timeline. So legislation in New York, after we witnessed what was passed and put into place in Washington State, like, like we mentioned earlier, New York was one of multiple other states that started to take a look at legislation for, for their own uh, states. And they introduced a bill back in May of 2022. Um, we're going to talk about it a little bit a, a little bit today. It did not move forward. Um, it was expected to be reintroduced this year, but was not. Um, it, you know, industry groups are continuing to work with state legislatures with, with the hope of it being revisited in 2024. So that's kind of where we're at in the, the progression of what was introduced initially and uh, the timeline of, of it getting back in front of um, uh, the legislatures. The goal of creating you know, public benefit as a way of supporting the increasing cost of long-term care really was threefold, right? It was delaying the middle-class families to spend down to poverty in order to receive Medicaid. It's to help strengthen the economy through workforce participation here. And it's really to help reduce the state Medicaid caseload, okay? So what we know about the law is the program that was proposed was available to all citizens of the state that qualify, okay? And you had to be 18 or above to qualify. Uh, next slide. You had to work and pay into the fund for 10 years without a five-year break or three out of the six years prior to needing the fund. Uh, the qualifying factor to receive the benefit was you had to be unable to perform three activities of daily living. The comptroller will provide a specific tax as well as the lifetime maximum and daily um, <clears throat> numbers September 30th, a year after they passed the bill. So the, the initial legislation did not have an actual tax amount that was being proposed. That was going to come after the bill was, was uh, approved or passed. Premiums thereafter can be adjusted by the controller four years after the program is passed and then biannually, uh, biannually thereafter. There was an opt-out provision, which is on this slide, um, that was currently written into the proposed legislation, similar to Washington, to allow for program taxation exemption if private long-term care policies are purchased before program enactment. So the big difference from what occurred in Washington to what was being investigated and proposed in New York was the opt-out window. They saw what happened in Washington when they left that open and over a half a million people went and secured private coverage and hence really underfunded their state fund, right, for this for this tax, because a lot of people were exempt from the tax. New York is not going to make the same mistake. They are, the way they wrote the exemption is there will be a, a, a private insurance exemption, but it's going to have to, you're going to have to have coverage prior to the passing of the law, right? So you're not going to have that opt-out window, which we'll talk about more in a few minutes. The last piece that we have that we wanted to touch on today, go to the next slide, is really pivoting away from the legislation and what the state level's done, to talk a little bit about private insurance coverage options. Um, the most popular and available um, type of coverage is what we call hybrid life insurance policies. Uh, before we take a deeper dive into this type of coverage, you know, below are really two primary reasons employers are considering this type of benefit offering. One, it's typically an employee paid benefit. So it's no cost to the county, to, to, to the municipality that's made available to the convenience of payroll deduction. It's most readily available long-term care benefit that an, that an employer can provide currently to their employees. 
um, and it provides employees with an opportunity to enroll in a benefit that may qualify, okay, and may is a key, key term there, for a state tax exemption. Now, we, we don't know for sure, but we're gonna talk about that in a moment. So what is hybrid life insurance with long-term care? And, and why are a lot of both public and private sector companies considering this as an addition to their benefits portfolio? It's when I say hybrid, it's part life insurance, part long-term care benefit. So it's a permanent life insurance benefit, typically offered through payroll deduction. It complements any existing life insurance that you may currently already offer to employees like group life insurance or voluntary group life insurance. It also would not replace um, any individual policies that, that, a, that, a, that an employee may have. So it is truly complementary. The permanent features, the advantages of that is rates are good okay, to never go up. They're based on uh, an employee or a family member's age and tobacco status. And then they're locked in at those rates. Okay, so there's rate security. These products are portable. So if an employer member leaves the county, uh, they can take the coverage with them and pay for it at the same price on a direct basis. Um, so it's something that they can take with them and not lose if they if they change employment or retire. The two components, the life insurance is pretty self-explanatory. It's a it's a death benefit up to a cap based on the underwriting that the carrier provides um, that the employee can enroll in and family members. So there's a death benefit, just like traditional life insurance is payable you know, upon a, a death of a policyholder. And then secondly, there's a long-term care benefit, okay, which typically pays an insured or covered family member, 4% of the death benefit and monthly long-term care benefit. So let me provide an example. An individual purchases a $100,000 life policy. They have, they go out with a long-term care claim. They would receive 4%, so $4,000 per month for up to 25 months. So the way it works, the easiest way to explain it is if you if you if you claim against the long-term care you're spending down the death benefit or the face amount of your life policy okay um, several of these policies met the opt-out requirements in washington state okay so that was a key way that employees um, were able to uh, obtain uh, qualified coverage to opt out of the tax in that state all right Couple important features and considerations here, um, specifically to New York and to, to this audience. The, the, the product really needs to meet the requirements um, and it's part of the Internal Revenue Code. It's called 770B Tax Qualified. In short, this is part of the code that defines what constitutes a qualified long-term care insurance contract and how it's treated for tax purposes. Currently, two insurance carriers in the state meet that requirement, okay? Guaranteed issue. This should be a benefit that's always available to your employees on a, on a, on a guaranteed, um, no knockout question uh, basis, okay? There'll be a limit to that, but it's really a non-starter. It's something that, that, that needs to be made available for this to be an effective uh, part of your benefit offering and to meet, and meet the needs that we've explained today. And lastly, due to the, the new nature of this type of benefit, um, there, there's really a, um, a need for a high level of communication. And, and that's best done on a personalized basis, right? So this is a type of product for, for, for counties that, that, that go down the path of evaluating it and potentially um, you know, implementing it for their employees and members. It's not one that's effectively enrolled online via self-service. It's one that needs to be done in an active environment where counselors can meet with people on an individual basis. And that can be done in a whole myriad of ways. It can be done on site, it can be done telephonically, virtually, but it is one that um, requires that type of attention to be effectively uh, rolled out and to make sure people understand the options and, and, and the potential need for the benefit um, and it gives everybody a chance to make the appropriate choice for them and their family members. Uh, next slide. Okay, so we don't have a crystal ball, right? So we, we just simply cannot predict if and when legislation will be considered here again in New York. With that said, 
you know, employers um, that we're talking to, they, they really have, you know, choices to, to choose from, right? They can they can do nothing with this at this point. They, they, can, they can kind of wait and see what happens and react, or they can be proactive and begin to explore some of these private long-term care insurance options that are available at this point, okay? Um, the slide kind of hits on what we talked about earlier. It's not just the tax avoidance strategy um, that's, a, that's available for folks that may want to secure coverage to avoid paying an additional tax, but it's also a valuable benefit to cover significant potential long-term care costs that you and family members may um, need to need to address in the future, right? So great way to, to, to secure coverage, to get it on a guaranteed issue basis, to get it through employment, um, and then, you know, an added benefit really is who knows exactly how the law is going to look if it one is passed here in New York, but the options that we're considering and, and showing to folks that are interested in having these discussions are ones that did meet the requirements in Washington state and were utilized in that capacity in, in that state. Um, so they're, they're, they're best positioned to uh, be a good fit in this capacity also here in New York. We'll have to monitor what happens from a legislation process, right, and, and adjust accordingly. Uh, but for those of you that are interested in learning more, you know, we would welcome an opportunity to meet to discuss these, you know, solutions in greater detail. You know, our contact info is on the last slide. You know, please feel free to reach out with any questions. Um, and Mark, that, that really includes our, our content presentation for today. You know, Tony and I would be more than happy to answer any questions from the audience. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Mick. Uh, very informative. Uh, and I, I learned a lot today, and I learned a lot in our, our conversations leading up to this webinar. I want to encourage uh, participants, county participants who are on the webinar today to, to um, write in any questions that you may have as we have these experts with us right now. I'm going to start the questions with, with this one. Uh, both of you have a pretty good sense of what's happening in uh, in New York in terms of employers, uh, municipalities, counties, school districts, as well as private sector employers. Are you getting a lot of questions about long-term care? Um, and, and do you have any employers who are currently working with your team to implement a long-term long care solution, benefit solution? Anthony, you want to tackle that first or do you want me to? Yeah, yeah. So um, we do have a few right now um, that are, you know, trying to be a little more proactive in that sense. Um, we're seeing that more on the private side, in my experience. Um, but there still are a lot of employers um, that are kind of in wait and see mode uh, in regards to the legislation. My only caution to that would be um, because of the, the lack of an opt out window um, you know, when the legislation is enacted, um, you know, to, to avoid any penalties or tax liabilities, it, you know, my, my, my advice to clients and customers is to, you know, offer the benefit, um, be proactive, and, uh, you know, if, if something should come to pass with legislation, we're prepared, and if not, we're offering employees a, a greater benefit package. Thank you, which is important uh, in today's uh, uh, employer market, employee market, right? It's, it's uh, more and more challenging for counties and the state of New York, frankly, to attract and retain uh, public sector workers. So one thing, one place that counties are looking are, are the voluntary benefits uh, uh, packages that they offer. So this could be a um, one of those uh, voluntary benefits that you may be exploring or wish to explore as you move into the future. And I could say on behalf of NISAC, we track every piece of legislation that would have a direct or indirect impact on counties, and that includes counties <laughs> as employers. So we will be you know, uh, looking at bills as they get introduced in 2024 and, well, they're being introduced now on a daily basis, but we'll be looking for this bill to uh, reemerge as we head into the 2024 legislative session. For Mick, is there a minimum benefit amount for private 
long-term care coverage to qualify for the exemption in Washington state. And, I, and the reason I ask that is, is this something that the New York state legislature may be looking at uh, when they propose another piece of uh, uh, another piece of legislation? You know, it's, it's not currently written into the proposed legislation from 2022 here in New York, but the way it was handled in Washington state was, um, there was a lot of, it's a great question because there was a lot of back and forth uh, discussion between, you know, the insurance carriers that were operating in that state, the brokers that were providing services and employers that were looking for further guidance on that. And it was such a moving uh, target and goal line that what we saw happen out there was there, were, there was no definitive language, language on a uh, minimum benefit size. So what most insurance companies um, and employers did was they they tried to match at a minimum the state benefit, right? So um, for folks that were looking to opt out, uh, it was a minimum $36,500 benefit that was presented. Um, and that is how we saw the, the vast majority, without any clear language in the bill, the, the vast majority of um, the product offering was set up in that manner with that being the minimum to meet at, at, at the very least state benefit. Uh, that said, I think, you know, there was an opt, there was an extended opt out in that state, and I think due to the 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 the, uh, the lack of any clear guidance, uh, actual guidance, um, there was plenty of folks that enrolled in smaller benefits after that. Um, so, long answer, kind of a kind of a moving uh, a target out in Washington. It's it's not clearly been defined in the legislation here in New York either. But I think a uh, um, you know best practice is to to have the, the private insurance benefit at a minimum to meet. Uh, you know, that state $36,500 lifetime benefit. Yeah, we do know that uh, our lawmakers at the state level do look at what's happening in other states and they they uh, they learn from what worked and what, what did, didn't work in other states. So you can imagine that uh, the lawmakers who proposed this legislation in 2022 are taking a look at what other states are doing, what worked and what didn't, and will will uh, will amend that legislation accordingly if if it is uh, reintroduced um, is there a cap uh, or was there a cap on the tax in the proposed legislation here in new york there is no cap so there's no income cap um, so it's something and, and because of that and that was it was the same way out, out in washington where the, the law is already in force uh, because of that there you know it, it shifted the discussion i think at the employer level to a certain extent um, you know, these products aren't new to, the, to our markets. They, they just never, um, in many cases, received the attention of, of, the, of the, you know, the valuable benefits they could provide to, a, to a, an employee and their family members. That said, um, you know, the tax avoidance component of it really gained a lot of steam, uh, particularly because decision makers with a lot of groups are high earners. And um, it, it caught their attention. It was something they were personally interested in because there was not a cap on the income. So in Washington State, it's 0.58% of, of uh, you know, of your income with no cap. And what's being proposed, one of the options in California right now is as high as 2%. Now, New York never, you know, proposed an actual uh, percentage of, you know, tax. However, they did clearly put in the initial legislation um, that there, it would be uncapped. So uncapped here, it's currently uncapped in Washington. And like I said, as a result of that, there's it, there's been increased interest um, for various different reasons. But one of them is, you know, as a tax avoidance strategy, um, you know, if it's possible to get a benefit in place that is likely, and we'll, we'll, we'll definitely say likely, right? Because we don't have something that's concrete here in New York at this point. Um, you know, that, that, that would qualify as an ex, uh, exempt, you know, for an exemption uh, due to having private coverage, uh, that's something that employers are, are looking at, um, you know, from a tax avoidance strategy for their employees. So no cap, Mark. Great, great, thanks. Um, so I've got just a couple more questions and I'm encouraging uh, uh, participants, if you have a question, now's a great time to type it into your question panel on your webinar uh, dashboard. Um, you know, New York is kind of a unique environment in terms of uh, the the way our state legislature acts. Has and you may not know the answer, and that's fine. But has there been a discussion about requiring employers to make a contribution in an employee's long-term care benefit? 
up to this point, there has not been. I'm not. I'm not going to say there hasn't been the conversation. The 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 initial legislation that was brought um, to, to the floor in 2022 did not include that. Um, however, I would not be surprised if it does make its way into any revisions that we see reintroduced next year. Um, and the reason why I say that is um, the plan recommendations that California are currently evaluating now um, and doing an economic feasibility report on one of them or two of them i should say do include employer contributions so that state is looking at um you know an employer contribution in, the, in this benefit washington does not have it and what was brought initially um, in front of the legislature and here in new york also did not so i i wouldn't be surprised to see it but currently it does not the current iteration does not have an employer contribution Thanks. So, so what is the average? And, and and I recognize that in insurance, especially life insurance and long-term care insurance, there are a lot of factors that go into developing a premium. Uh, but what is the average premium for the average uh, worker for a county, say between 35 or, you know, 25 and 45, uh, an employee that wants to uh, um, begin to buy long-term care uh, coverage, what would a, a pre, what would a premium range be? So an, an employee or county member, you know, in that, in that 25 to 40 range, uh, non-tobacco, because these, these products are individual in nature. Like I mentioned, they're, they're, they're portable. So they have group features, meaning they're, you know, there's guaranteed issue and they're payroll deducted and that type of thing. But the employee does actually own the policy. Um, so tobacco status does go into that initial rate uh, determination, um, but that age age span for a benefit, um, you know, that would meet like a minimum requirement, like a thirty five thousand or thirty six thousand, forty thousand dollar benefit. You know, we're probably talking in the ten dollar per week range, and that, I mean that's a complete guesstimate. And it's going to differ obviously from the low end to the high end. So, you know. Not a lot, 40, 50 bucks a month, maybe for a policy like this. Um, now, if they want 100, they want $150,000 of coverage, you know, it's going to be more, obviously. So that kind of goes back, Mark, to the, you know, the, the need. Um, it, it, the folks on this phone, I'm sure, are familiar with, you know, the value and having some, you know, some education when it comes to benefit selections each year. But this is the type of product because of the individual nature, because of the, the, the vast, um, you know, wide array of pricing based on a number of factors really does you know highest participation when you know an, an employee has an opportunity to talk to a counselor and do it in an individual um type environment right so i would say you know ten dollars a week is probably a good you know just just shooting from the hip a good estimate of what type of premiums we're talking about for you know like a thirty-five thousand dollar policy for someone 40 years old yeah, no, thanks. Uh, I appreciate you shooting from the hip. I just wanted to, to put some context around it for uh, the folks on the line and, and the folks that are, are uh, tuning in to, to watch this webinar that has been recorded. So yeah. at this point, uh, I want to give our panelists one more, um, uh, one more minute each to, to wrap up uh, what, we, what we talked about and learned today. And then I'm going to close down this webinar. So first, Anthony, please, uh, any, any closing comments? Yeah, uh, thank you, Mark. You know, one of the things that I, I just really want to start when it comes to long-term care insurance, specifically in, in our state, is, um, you know, the uncertainty surrounding the legislation right now. Um, I think Mick can attest to the fact, because he's more of an expert in this than I am, that something is going to be approved eventually. It's just what that will look like in its final phases once the legislation is approved. You know, so my, my biggest recommendation and my biggest piece of advice to employers out there in the market is be proactive. Um, you know, look look at this this coverage in a, on a voluntary basis. Um, you know, when you do that, it doesn't cost you anything as an employer, but you increase choice, flexibility, and options among your benefits. Um, with your employees. So, you know, again, and Mark, as you mentioned, that that is, you know, in today's day, um, very important because you want to be an employer of choice um, and the, the workforce is harder than ever to, um, you know, really get good quality employees in there. So, you know, use it as a recruiting tool, 
be proactive um, and really explore all the options available to you as an employer um, for your employees. No, that, Thank that's, you. And now, uh, and now, Mick. I, I would I would echo what what Anthony shared. Um, you know, it, we're we're kind of on the um, the beginning of this journey, right? Um, I know on Assured Partners we have four or five uh, employer groups that are implementing this benefit here for one one of twenty four. Um, they were very uh, they were early to the table. We had great discussions. A lot of folks had very limited knowledge of, of uh, you know what the need was. Um, and what, what what potential insurance products were out there that were available to help assist them, assist them with it. Um, I think a, an important piece of it that Anthony mentioned is, you know, where it's really helping most of the folks we're speaking with is, you know, setting this up as a true voluntary employee benefit, um, you know, something that you sponsor and make available to your members, um, but something that offers them a, a lot of choice on on coverage levels. If or, if or not, they want to get involved with it. And then, um, you know, getting it in place with a with the an effective communication strategy and using it as a as a way to enhance your overall benefit package for your employees. Um, so we're we're excited. We we see this uh, becoming a, a much more prevalent part of the overall benefit discussion as we move into 2024. And um, you know, we're, we're we're starting to set up meetings to have these discussions here uh, early next year to to go through these on an individual basis with different different employers and counties that may be interested in learning more. I right, thank you very much, Nick Gibo from Assured Partners and Anthony Brothers from Assured Partners for spending some time today to educate our members about the long trends in long-term care in New York State and, and across the nation. I also want to thank our members who attended today's webinar and encourage you to send an email to me, Mark Levine, mlevine at nysac.org, or Jeanette Stanziano, jstanziano at nysac.org. If you have any uh, questions, comments about this webinar or ideas for future webinars that you believe would help you better serve your county and residents. Thank you very much. Have a great day, everyone.